<laughs> hello everybody welcome to the state of craft we're on episode 17 here and i still can't believe we're in the teenage numbers here but here we are <laughs> uh the state of craft is a series that focuses on having open-ended discussions on the state of the legal craft cannabis industry what's going well what's not going well and what we can do to make things better and more accessible uh for uh everybody here uh in our lovely industry uh it's hosted by uh certicraft uh, i'm sammy i'm the ceo of certicraft uh we're on a mission to help craft cannabis producers transition into and thrive within the regulated market in canada uh, and our flagship product is a compliance platform that makes the uh, ridiculously tedious uh, paperwork and uh reporting requirements for cannabis producers really really simple um a few housekeeping a few housekeeping items before i introduce our lovely guests here today um we have a chat section uh we really encourage you guys to say hi and engage there uh the discussions are always a lot more fun when people are active and saying what they think as we go along um, if you have any questions we have a dedicated questions tab that's separate from the chat uh, please ask your questions there um, once a question is asked you can upvote it if you like it and you want to hear the answer to that question as well and at the end we'll go through the questions in the order of um, um, of upvotes um, so with all that being said i'm gonna bring in Don and Carol here and uh, say hi. Hi, Don. Hi, Carol. How are you guys doing today? Hi, hey, Sammy. How's it going? Yeah, doing, doing quite all right. Well, I appreciate you guys being here. And uh, yeah, maybe I'll turn the floor over to you guys so you can each uh, say a thing or two about yourselves so our audience yes. has a better sense yeah. of who you are. Great. Hi. Uh, well, I'm Carol. Carol Gwilt uh, from Weeds and few other places. Uh, happy to be here on State of Craft with you, Sammy. And I brought my pal here, Don. Let's say hi, Don. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. Could, could you guys tell us? I mean, you guys have a very, very interesting history compared to um, yeah. most of the guests that we've had in, in the past here. Um, would you be willing to take a moment or two to kind of give us a history of where you've been in the world of cannabis and where you've arrived at now, just so that everybody has a bit more context on who you are and the perspective that you're going to be sharing today. Sure. Don and I are uh, coming up on uh, 20 years in, in a relationship that started uh, all over wanting to, to forge ahead in business with a uh, cannabis business. So we are yeah. both in the industry back in 2003 when we met and uh, we quickly hooked up together, started a really nice shop on Commercial Drive where we openly sold cannabis to adults um, without a medical card. So it was a recreational shop in 2004. We uh, we were both incarcerated for, for our activity there. Don got 30 months in a prison and I got 17 months in provincial jail. Um, we went on to open up several dispensaries with other people. Um, uh, I worked, I, my, my edge was in the medical market mostly, um, or, you know, medicinal market. I don't want to say medical, but, um, and uh, Don has just been full on recreational, no fear, you know, let's get these laws changed. And yeah, that's uh, right. he, he went on after his uh, two and a half year sentence for, for the decline, he went on to help well, now, when I count them today, he helped 12 dispensaries that are now legal get their start in, into the legal realm before starting Weeds. And with Weeds, we had, we opened 44 stores. Some of them didn't last very long, but um, at one time we had 38 stores in operation at the same time yeah. in six provinces. And uh, we had uh, a staff of over 300 people helping us pre-legalization yeah. and uh, and we had to let them all go except for you know two two other people besides ourselves when legalization came along so it's been a, a pretty devastating ride in that way and then you know we stuck to it we all we said we'd never quit and we never did and here we are with with two legal stores and how long have those stores been in operation, the two legal ones? Uh, we opened up in Seashelt uh, last January, yeah. so almost coming up on one year. And we've been open in Vancouver, our first store, legal store in Vancouver, 
we've been open there for about three weeks. Whoa, super recent. Congratulations. Super recent. It took us a long time to, to get to that license. That's yeah. that's quite the journey. I mean, I, I'm impressed that you guys were incarcerated and like as soon as you're out, like we're willing to be like right back at it and say, fuck this. This is a fucked up system. This should not be illegal. We're going to be part of the change. And we're going to do it by just showing our finger to the law and, and doing what we think should should exist. That's, yeah, we weren't, that doing it to, we weren't doing it to show our finger to the law. But, you know, we yeah. just had this, you know, I come from a, from this into this industry as a medical user. And so, you know, it's just my belief. And, you know, I just I wanted to to assert that. And yeah, um, yeah make, yeah. make tr help to try to make things right for people or at least, you know, give people some. Yeah. Some help and comfort. Yeah, that's right. I'll let him talk to you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> anyways, uh, yeah, we, we knew the laws were wrong, and uh, you know, I, what else could we do? It, it was it was completely um, wrong. So what we did is we we basically just continued on as if it was not illegal, and uh, as as uh, we opened the stores, we paid all the taxes. Uh, we paid a living wage. We had medical and dental. And then uh, when once we realized uh, the dream of having legalization, uh, basically they shut us out. Uh, they uh, forced us to voluntarily close our stores. Otherwise, we'd never been able to open a store. And uh, now the government is is uh, in, uh, the middleman, and uh, they're yeah. they're reaping. Uh, massive profits off, off uh, of the people who are working uh they're opening up mega stores everywhere in, in bc and uh that's forcing some of the independent people to close you know so there's a lot of a lot of fixing to be done in this legalization well you we came to the right podcast to talk about it uh, <laughs> before before we get into that though i want to i want to first focus on the positive and yeah i want to yeah. get a sense for <laughs> What 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 are a few things that you think have been really positive as an outcome of legalization in the, in this world of craft cannabis? Well, we're not we're not wasting our tax resources with the police and jails and courts on that, so that's that's a good relief. And that now people who uh, consume it, whether it's medical or recreational, personally, I think it's all medical, but uh, um, they don't have to worry about the law out of the law grabbing them from the back and throwing them in jail. So. Th the, the fear is gone. The cost is gone. Uh, a lot of good things have happened, positive things. Uh, now they're doing research on it, and they're finding out it's good for so many different diseases and illnesses and helping a lot of people. So there's really a lot of good good things, a lot of positive things happening. Mm -hmm. People can find their, their way more easily with it, if yeah. they're, especially, you know, using it as medicine and whatnot. It's kind of opening doors up that way. So people yeah. are... Yeah, better relief yeah, that way. And a lot of older people uh, who have arthritis and a lot of pain, uh, some of these uh, drugs that they're taking turns them into a vegetable. All they do is sit in a chair all day. They, uh, they're, they're scared because of the lies that were told about it many years ago. And mm -hmm. so now when, when you want to help somebody, you give them a little uh, bomb of some kind that has uh, you know, some THC and, and uh, CBD in it. And all of a sudden they can move their wrist and they're not drugged up. And uh, mm -hmm. they're very, very happy about that. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really benefited our seniors in, in many, many ways. And do you, do you, is, so I'm, I'm not somebody who had, I mean, you know, when you, when you go into a recreational store, yeah, there's, there's not a lot of, it's not like there's like, shelves you can go and pick things out and look at them in the way that bc is regulated so i'm curious like is like there a lot of these kind of topicals and bombs and things like that for these kind of seniors that are readily available at recreational stores not in ours actually no. we uh we do carry a cbd um lotion and whatnot but no i mean pre-legalization pre we had a whole uh, range of different uh psalms bombs and uh, different uh capsules that they could take but now because of the legalization they've they've basically cut cut it back the the amounts of uh thc that you can put in uh in a in a chocolate is uh, 10 milligrams we used to put 100 milligrams in and sell that maybe for 12 dollars now they gotta become uh diabetic and and spend 100 dollars for the same amount of medication it's just not fair for them but you know, still, it's a positive thing because it is now legal. They can carry it 
and, and consume it without any fear of repercussions, right? Oh. Yeah. Sorry. A <laughs> cool sound effects coming in out of nowhere. <laughs> it's a spaceship. It's, it's a spaceship. <laughs> Anybody who. But ideally, like we, we sell tinctures and you know oils and whatnot, and that's pretty medicinal and very versatile too. So you know, yeah. for for the people that are coming in looking for some kind of you know medicinal product, that's kind of what I'm my go to is is just the the tincture, and then it's you know use it as you will. Yeah, you, know, you can put it in your body or on your body, and it's going to help you. One one of my biggest gripes with legalization and how it's rolled out so far has been kind of the focus on recreational at the detriment of medical yes. within within the world of cannabis and you know on a just on a flower level the inability to find something that's like a five percent six percent thc and have that just be some for, for certain people a thing that you know along with all the other terpenes and cannabinoids be something that they can use the lack of having suppositories that have more than 10 milligrams of thc in them like just just there's a whole bunch of different things that just make no sense when you're talking about medical and it's and it's kind of like the government like just wants you to get fucked up. It's kind of the sense that I get. It's like, oh, they want you to forget. Well, they don't accept that that it is actually medicine for people, right? So yeah, it's that's that's the disconnect so is that you yeah. know medical users aren't being served even you know with the quality. That's my big thing is, is the quality of the medical product you know that LPs are able to to sell is the same as the recreational product that they're selling. But that's that's hit and miss with quality. So if you're a medical user, I don't I don't feel that you're being served by any kind of system that's set up in Canada, except for the gray market dispensaries that are considering quality for medical patients. I mean, I live I live in the Kootenays and, you know, I know quite a few growers out here who've gotten licensed who have been breeders for decades and they've bred all kinds of genetics specifically to help friends and families of theirs who are suffering from cancer suffering from um you know yeah. ms all kinds of different ailments and the genetics that they've bred are they have some thc in them but the focus isn't on the thc the focus is on the holistic effect in terms of how the it's whole plant medicine yeah. yeah and now that they're in this legal world all of a sudden this genetics that was very very popular and very very uh demanded before they can't sell it. They can't. They can't grow it because they won't be able to sell it because the the BCLDB and all the other provincial distribution boards have this very arbitrary. If it's not above twenty percent THC, we're not going to buy it. Yeah, I don't know um, where that came from. Like, where did that yeah. come from? That was never a focus in the gray market dispensaries that I know of. It was the focus on how Quality. much THC was in it? You know, yeah, everybody and safety of the product and uh, no mold and all these. I guess things. before when people could see see the bud before they buy it, they could see you know that this is probably going to be a high THC bud, and I'm going to like it. Now they're just kind of going by the label, so I guess that's what their marker is is just the THC level in it. But there's so many strains that we're missing out on in the rec market. Yeah. Like you were saying, all these strains that people have bred for decades and whatnot and where are they you know yeah. it seems like designer strains are coming out and everybody's getting them you know all the lps are bringing out the same kind of strains onto the market it's there's not a lot of diver diversity in strains so so we've switched here to like what's not going well before before we keep right. going down this path no no that's totally, totally, <laughs> fine, totally fine it was, it was natural it was totally natural i just want to take a pause and see if there's anything else that is going well that you want to talk oh. about before we uh keep going down this path it's going well for simple possession right i mean you can you can get away with having pot in your hand now but so oh, that, i was gonna turn that into a negative but i'm gonna try <laughs> <laughs> yeah. anything from your end Don? i guess just you know the whole stigma oh. is kind of lessening now right on yeah. pot it's it is becoming an alternative for people now so sure. i guess that's uh, more and more people are trying it all the time and they're liking it for a lot yeah. of reasons no hangover in the morning uh you know you're not you don't get really really impaired uh can <clears throat> if, if it's your own weed nobody can spike it with something that's going to make you pass out you know what i mean so yeah. there's, there's a lot of, does that anyways but well and they do they apparently they do it in bars with drinks and, and all, mm. you know that kind of thing right yeah. so you know so long as you know you got a safe clean uh product nobody can 
tamper with it really and you know so there's a lot of really good positive things that are happening so so and the rest of the world in the rest of the world is following suit uh germany now just uh starting to look at uh, recreational they've had medical for really? quite a while now. portugal uh, uh all kinds of different countries are uh, the caribbean countries are all looking at it jamaica is legalizing they're opening up stores so i think it's a good positive so that's, that's a, and, and that's a research yeah. and all these kind of things right we're inspiring the rest of the world to yeah you know, i guess have said that you know, they're inspired because we were able to get licenses so why can't they yeah i mean uruguay started this whole thing off maybe like over a decade ago but i guess yeah for a lot of countries they don't they don't think of uruguay as like a developed modern country so it didn't really like have much impact whereas canada for better or for worse i think it's for worse is seen in in this light of like oh you're an advanced country and so now we're going to take yeah. take this thing seriously as an actual option because Uruguay didn't matter to us. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, okay, so you guys, you guys have opened uh, two stores now. You have one in Seychelles uh, that's been operating just under a year, and one in Vancouver that's only been open for three weeks now. What What have you seen that's been like really challenging that you weren't necessarily expecting as you have gone down this path of uh, of legalization for your own stores? Oh, just going down the path. Well, just the, I guess, the big frustration has just been the amount of time that yeah, it's taken. A lot of time. It's it just... took us um, well over two years to reopen our store on Kingsway, and we were, you know, involved. We had our license in, and it just it took so long to to process. They're blaming a little a little bit of it on COVID, but you know, and they're still... blaming a, a little bit of it on you know our, our difficult past, and did they want to even let us into the industry? <laughs> and you know, yeah, that too. Um, I had to go through a, a heck of a screening program just to to pass all the tests right mm -hmm. and uh, yeah so <laughs> i think we passed all the tests well yeah. you guys are you guys are lucky in some ways that you, that the provincial it's the provincial government that handles those licenses because the federal government would not let you have a license if you'd had if you'd been incarcerated in the past for a cannabis related crime so so they um they're they're they take a much harder stance with much um less leniency on the federal level which where so all, all the producers who've ever been incarcerated they're like they're in a really difficult place if this is what they love and the, when they, what they want to keep doing but they want to do it in a legal yeah. kind of way which makes yeah. no sense of course because it's like you legalize it which clearly means you're admitting that it was wrong because <laughs> you wouldn't legalize it otherwise open for the black market it's yeah, just leaving the door well. open for all these unlicensed producers who you know they're they not have families they, they need to make mm -hmm. a living yeah what are they going to do you know start uh, some other business that they they put many, many years of, uh, in their lives in. Yeah. So, so, um, out, so outside of the licensing challenges and the length of time that that took, once you got operating with your with your stores, were there any surprises or challenges there that you weren't really expecting? Well, in Seashelt, we opened in January, and in April, uh, less than one kilometer away, about eight hundred meters away from us, the uh, BC Cannabis store opened which in Seashell, they have been on in, um, in ind indigenous land. And so it's very cheap for people to go and shop there because they don't pay taxes uh, you know, in, in that store. So they're undercutting us by 30% easily, you know, just by the nature of how they get their product and how we get our product. And they, you know, they charge us a 15% distribution fee, which, nobody is paying in those stores. So that was really a real big challenge. I know one of our neighboring, there's a few dispensaries in, in the Sunshine Coast and the one that's nearest to us besides the cannabis store is now closing down because the cannabis store, the BC cannabis store has taken all their business from them and uh, left a little bit for us. But, uh, you know, it's a small town. We don't expect huge things out of that town, but, um, it, it's not that fair, you know, that the BC Cannabis store is able to to do that, to go and open up 50 stores across the province. And, you know. and, and they're using our tax resources 
and uh, you know we we had to use our money to to pay rents and and do all these renovations. Uh, they're spending thousands and thousands of dollars on on cabinets and everything else. Uh, they're funding their stores through tax dollars, which we're paying for, and 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 uh, again they're charging us a fifteen percent uh, distribution fee. So you know. It, I don't see the free enterprise in that very much, but it's still better than, than the black market, the gray market. But, you know, the difference between the black market and the gray market is, is uh, you know, we, we paid uh, all the taxes, uh, GST, PST, personal taxes, uh, corporate taxes, property taxes, all these kind of things. We didn't buy guns, heroin, or cocaine. We didn't shoot at people. We didn't disrespect the government and or the laws. Whereas, you know, the black market people were into human trafficking, uh, not paying taxes, uh, guns, all the kind of things that you would look at, right? So the cannabis people were basically shut out of, of this and, and for no other reason than, than we were doing doing it even though we knew it was wrong i mean they were wrong we were right and then they finally have come around to realizing it that it's not a dangerous drug that uh, causes you to go insane or murder people and uh, <laughs> so now they, you know they're they're reaping huge amounts of money off it uh, off the backs of the people who who've worked and so hard in the industry and fought so hard to get it legalized yeah, in some ways, the government's like the, the only the only real entity in this whole uh, supply chain and this whole industry that uh, doesn't have to struggle because they charge that excise uh, tax on the federal level, yeah. even though it's split with the provinces. So they're guaranteed a dollar per gram, no matter what. Uh, and then, which of course doesn't make sense when you look at like you look at the like the price of like outdoor flour right now, and it can go for like seventy five cents or less per gram. So you're telling me that you're going to charge a hundred and thirty percent plus tax already, not even including the future taxes that are going to be charged. And yeah. then, like on the provincial side, taking a look at the BC LDB, they're they just got a fifteen percent markup. No matter what, you're 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 we're getting a fifteen percent cut, and so there's there's no risk there for for either for any of the government parties involved i mean the big risk that they have that, that i don't understand how they don't see and how they don't understand is that if you make it so unfeasible financially for people people aren't going to transition and so your pie is going to be limited to this very small size instead of allowing there to be a massive pie where yeah. you have a small cut of it not a big one but that cut yeah. is going to be way bigger than what you have right now it's bigger than the entire pie right now even. If they just let more people in i mean yeah. it could, you know it would be a better situation all around to take the government out of the the distribution business and you know let us do how it's always been done basically you know a supplier to you know, the pot shop, you yeah. know, and I, I believe and collect that. the taxes, and that's all you know. That's all they needed to do, but they kind of bungled that up a lot. Mm -hmm. I believe Alberta is is getting out of the distribution uh, portion of the industry now. Oh, did they announce that? Yeah, that well, it's yes, yeah, I believe it's been announced, but I don't know. You know, fact check it, and, and but it, that's that's what I hear. I know they were talking about it. I'm not sure. And Ontario is kind of making waves that way too aren't they 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 just introduced something called flow through which i i'm not too familiar with i see abian is typing something into the chat right now and he'll be a lot more familiar with that so i bet you he's going to pipe up and share um yeah. share a thing or two about uh, uh about that system but um and he's oh no he says the aglc is stepping back from online sales online. okay, okay. All right. Um, um, well, and also the uh, the farm to gate is coming up. We're hoping to get involved in that, and that would be again. So it's, it's only talk and rumors, but they they claim that you're the farm to gate will be able to sell directly to uh, to the to, to the stores. So that's and, so there's two so there's two different programs. Farmgate is not that. Farmgate will let um, a producer have their own store at their farm, so people can come by it, like kind of like a wine tour uh, yeah, type yeah. thing. There's a different program called direct delivery, which is what you're talking about, which will allow um, yeah. a retail store to sell to you directly. They still have to register their SKUs for their products with the BCLDB, but yeah. it won't. There won't be like a physical, and, and you'll still purchase through the BCLDB. They'll have like an interface, but it's. Uh, on what they're saying is that it's going to be a lot simpler um, mm -hmm. as in you know it's not going to be a two-month process to get the SKU approved instead it'll be shorter what that length of time 
is i don't know i've been pushing hard that it needs to be like a day or two maximum yeah. um and uh and that uh, they're not gonna ve- they're not they're not gonna be subjective about it it's as long as it's legal and it meets all the requirements to be legally sold they will list it and then you have access to this uh, centralized uh um source of all the different centralized catalog that's what i should call it of all the different things and they'll just take their fee still charging 15 percent, even though they're doing way less now which is absolutely ludicrous because uh because <laughs> yeah. now because they're not they're not in the picture anymore right so now you assume that much more risk that much more costs because yeah, now you have to deal with more. shipping and insurance and all that stuff directly without them doing that for you and uh on some level why would a retailer want to 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 do that. this direct route if they're still being charged a 15 percent markup it makes no sense it's <laughs> I, I think the bcldb is eroding a lot of trust right now they, they have an opportunity here to build trust and build like real camaraderie make it clear that they want things to be better but i think they're doing themselves a massive disservice in in the way oh, yeah. they're approaching this yeah. uh this release unfortunately yeah, yeah. and uh I, I don't think i don't think they're vetting the product uh, product very well because uh, we, we we run every product that we sell in our store um, under a microscope and check it out and we've had to set a lot of the product back because uh, it, it didn't meet uh, our quality standards well I'd like to qualify that we don't we don't put every product under the microscope but just the raw flour yeah well, we sorry have. that's what I meant yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would imagine you wouldn't uh, get to see much if you're looking at like a, a distillate or <laughs> or an oil or extraction. <laughs> yeah, let's look at this chocolate bar, the, the outer shell layer. <laughs> it looked neat, but you're not going to find anything in there. It's just weird for customers to have to buy out of a box like that, you know, or a package and whatnot. And speaking of that, overpackaged everything. Oh my God, it's terrible. <laughs> the, the garbage that's being produced. Yeah. And that was supported by the Green Party when they when when they put that in. Well, anyway, so yeah. So so what what kind of what kind of things have you been finding with the flower that uh, that you return? That I return. Um, well, I'm looking for molds and mildews, basically uh, pesticide evidence, uh, you know, insect evidence and whatnot. Um, basically, those things, yeasts, um, and uh, you know. I mean, that's all I'm looking for is a cleanliness, the the actual quality of the bud or the, you know, the maturity of the bud is kind of more of a, um, something like if a, if a customer bought that and it was just, you know, clean, but immature, people wouldn't even know what that looks like probably. But yeah. if people have concerns that aren't, uh, you know cleanliness concerns then you know that's something they take up with the producer like i'm gonna sell it to them you know what i mean yep. but if it's got mold or mildew on it then i don't want that in my store and so i'm i'm turning away a lot of pot in this i'm industry. i'm a little shocked to, to hear that because health canada's whole thing is like they they make it so that you basically can't have any microbial life in your um in your cannabis if you're going to sell it so what what you're saying tells me is that there is a lot of dishonesty going on in the relationship between labs and um and uh um uh producers and and and, 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 there, there, and there is no um standard like health canada doesn't dictate to labs how they have to do things which is just so screwed up like how can you not have like a actual standard of what is expected for a lab test um but if you're finding things in a microscope that you're turning back then the amount of uh the parts per million that, that of of these different microbial lives it's going to be way above the, way. the hard limits that is set by health canada which are i think way too low because it makes it makes a very high quality clean organic outdoor cannabis never almost never pass the test because of just yeah, the that's natural right. life that's actually healthy and beneficial that's there and, and you're talking about unhealthy <laughs> unbeneficial <laughs> detrimental uh, bacteria and and yeast and mold and so on and so forth that's yeah it's definitely in there i mean there was just a, a voluntary recall just a couple of days ago for uh, i think it was a uh, powdery mildew in the product um that was something that i found actually and brought it to the um the uh, producer's attention and they went and 
had it tested again and they decided to recall the lot. So that, but that's the first one. I've had over two dozen uh, products that I've returned um, my case lots to, to the producers for. And that's the first time their recall has evolved because of that. And I, and I actually independently have taken some of the, um, every now and then I get a product and I call up the producer and I say, you know, I found mold in, in your product and they just don't believe me. You know, you're the only person in all of Canada to complain there. There's not mold in my product. So a couple of times I have passed and open products onto labs to get their um, test results. And yeah, they've come back um, full of, full of mold, like in the millions. And, yeah. um, and, there's still no recall. Like, I don't understand some of the things that, that go on there, yeah. you know, how people are, are moving through their processes and whatnot, but uh, kudos to the, to the couple of companies that I have seen doing recalls. Cause I can't imagine that's a cheap thing to, to go through right for them. Especially not with the kind of super tight, sometimes non-existent margins that exist in the world of legal cannabis today for producers. It hurts. Well, that's the government it anyways. hurts. I bet it. I bet it really hurts to like when you're you're growing your crop and you have powdery mildew on it. You know. Um, yeah. Some people are still putting that into jars. You know, seeing that it's there, and so, you know, I, I need to be diligent mm -hmm. to uh, to check for things like that. I've always done that, being from the legal or from the uh, medicinal market, right? We want to make sure our product is clean, so. Well, that's great that you guys have that kind of care and attention. Like, I don't, I doubt like even like 1% or 2% of retailers out there actually do anything of the sort. Yeah, but... I agree. No, I, I believe it. I mean, it's, it's difficult. It's expensive to do that as well, because, you know, first we have to buy the, the case of the product into the store, just, you know, sight unseen. And then I have to, as a consumer, buy one of those products to sample it, to, to scope it. I don't even want to smoke it. I just want to, you know, Take scope it and make sure that it's clean. Right. So, yeah. so if it's, if it's clean, then I've just bought, you know, an ounce of whatever product that I've just scoped and, and that's fine. But if it's not clean, then, you know, I have to start the return process and that takes sometimes months to do that too, just to, you know, return the product to, to the LDB, to the producer, or wherever it's going to go, and yeah. have some closure on that. You know, do you think this kind of process of checking the quality and potentially returning it? Do you think this is going to get easier with direct relationships between stores, or do you think that's one of the Absolutely. things where it'll get harder? It'll get easier. Um, I'll be able to see the product before I buy. Hopefully. Oh, yeah. I'm not so sure they'll let you do that. Uh, I, I hope they do, but uh, let's 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 assume for a moment that you can't do that. You still have to buy at least a case in order to make it happen. Do you do you think like because I guess what I, where I think what what I worry about is like the BCLDB is a government organization, so they have policies around returns and things like that. Could you potentially run into a scenario where a um, a producer says, no, it doesn't have mold. I have a COA. Here it is. I'm not taking it back for that reason. It, is is that a concern happened. of yours at all? That's happened a couple of times. Yeah. And um, it's taken months and just me kind of hounding the LDB to be, you know, that's unacceptable. I, I'm not, why, you know, they're trying to force me to sell you know, bad drugs, is, you know, an inferior product is, is that what's going on here? Because, you know, that's, that's not right. Why, why would they want to make me sell a product that I know is moldy? Yeah. To have the consumer find that like, that's, that's part of the system that's broken right there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be fixed. Yeah, that's that's really disconcerting, and this is the this is the first time hearing of it. And Earl Oliver, this is the first has... everybody hears of it <laughs> because everybody expects that the product is clean now that it's legal. Yeah. It's clean product. There's nothing to see. Um, you know, consumers don't know to to look for products. Just like when they buy craft beer, you know, they just crack open the can and they chug yeah. it. Yeah, it's you know, it's but but in this in this industry is still buyer beware as far as i'm concerned you know people should be looking at what they're getting and getting one of those jewelers loops to see that it's okay yeah and earl, earl oliver in the chat makes a good point that a coa um 
you can get a COA that shows it's clean, and all that means is that the sample was clean. But exactly. The rest of the crop control. could be, <laughs> to quote yeah. him, absolutely and crawling. <laughs> and that's what I've heard time and time again. Well, our retention sample is fine. You know, there's nothing to see. It must have been an isolated case. I feel like I should be, you know, on Willy Wonka here. It's I'm getting the golden ticket every time if I buy a one gram bag of something and I find mold in it. And then they tell me, oh, you're the only person to ever find mold in it. There is no mold. You know, I, I, that's that's a lucky bag. If I, that's the only bag <laughs> yeah. with mold in it in their in their. Well, mind. we're getting a lot of, we're, we're, we should go out and buy lottery tickets, right? <laughs> Do are are you guys find this is me just being curious here? Are you guys finding that like this happens consistently across the board amongst LPs, or does it tend to be like just bigger ones or just smaller ones? Like what? I don't know. I don't know. I there's a lot of LPs that we don't buy from. I, I have a very long list of LPs that we don't buy from, and luckily I have a long list of you know ones that we're willing to try. Um, you know. Yeah, basically like the smaller craft producers and whatnot. So that's the thing. I do try to be discerning and pick, you know, what I think are reputable companies that, that we want to have a relationship with. And so it's 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 very disconcerting when I when I find mold in these products, you know, where I think they are gonna be the top players in the, you know, in the yeah. game and they come out with something that, you know. People may make mistakes and mold happens after it's packaged, I guess. But it was something like powdery mildew, you yeah. know, that grows right on the plant, right? It doesn't yeah. happen after the plant is growing. So somebody along the way knows that they're putting powdery mildew into sometimes glass jars, which is yeah. extra weird, right? Yeah. <laughs> they, they want, you know, super packaging, but they got crap in it. So yeah. Yeah, and so I mean, we've grown before, and we, and we know, you know, once you get powdery mildew, it's not just an isolated spot here and there. It goes to the whole. Don says thing. he's grown before. It's funny. In 1999, he was arrested as BC's largest <laughs> pot grower ever. They they saw, oh, we've grown before. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. What was yeah. what do you say largest ever? What, what what was the size if you don't mind sharing? Well, the, the, it was the volume. It was it was uh, we had uh, grow ups everywhere, sixteen to fifty layers, and uh, all over the province. There were some of hundred miles. It, there was it, some... Allegedly, thirty four locations across. <laughs> when they yeah when large, they, when large the, the first day that they raided me, uh, they got eleven locations in the first day, and they had about. 50 officers come in and simultaneously raid all these locations. And then the following day, they started raiding more places, but by then they were shut down. So they, they missed some of those ones, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we we, um, we try to be, you know, mindful of who we're ordering from and whatnot. So yeah, that should help, but yeah, you know, in the gray market, I, I turned away about 70 to 80 percent of what i looked at as well so and it's, it's a little bit is the percentage comp okay so it's a bit, a bit better now it's a bit better here but i but i you know i had a lot more suppliers back then too right yeah um, and you and you would expect that you know if it was 70 percent before and now it's this legal world where like they're checking microbial life that it would go down to like ideally zero percent but realistically 15 20 somewhere there but it sounds like it's a lot more than that Oh, yeah, yeah I, I'd say maybe about yeah about twenty percent. Well, that's that's because we're not buying. I mean, if you're if you're trying to grow in, a, in an area that's you know 20, 20 acres of, of greenhouse, uh, it, it's really hard to control uh, pests. It's really hard to control uh, you know spider mites, mold, uh, bugs, and then once you get mold, it mold goes really fast. It's like spores, like uh, like. Uh, Mushroom spores, they just spread throughout the room because you got fans blowing all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, all the big buds are going to rot. So then they chop it down and then they try and take the, the, the mold and the rot, bud rot, mold, bud rot, same thing. So they try and take it out and then they dry it and package it and uh, there's still mold in there. So, yeah. you know, even if they irradiate it, uh, powdery mildew, uh, I don't want to smoke the residue of that. that that's like, a, that's like a, a dust. And, and I, don't, I don't want that going into my lungs because as you're smoking the joint, the powdery mildew is coming in, right? Same thing with the mold. As you're smoking it, it's not getting burned off, right? Yeah. So, 
yeah, we, we, we don't want, you know, it's supposed to be something healthy, not yeah. to, to turn to your health. Well, thanks for um, enlightening myself and I'm sure many of the audience about this reality. That's uh, pretty surprising. Um, the well, um, I, just, just a note for our audience, we're getting close to the end of the discussion part here. So if you get, if you have any more questions you want to ask, go ask them in the questions tab. If there's any questions already there that you really like, upvote them and we'll go through the questions in order once uh, we shift into that. Um, but, uh, with that being said, Don and Carol, um, Sammy, what, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> What's, uh, what are, what are some things that you think like really need to change to maybe address some of the issues you've been talking about here or address yeah. other issues we haven't talked about and yeah. how, how would you go about changing them to make, to, to I just them? get the government right out of their intrusion. They they don't belong in the pot business. They sure don't belong, you know, yeah. distributing it to us. You know, I mean, they're I mean, not even it, checking it properly either. It, it should be uh, some uh, private guys should be, you know, for a reasonable fee, go in check <laughs> check the the cannabis and pick what they're going to have it tested and tested for pesticides and tested for all these things. And then uh, I, I think that would make it a lot better. Yeah. Well, for me, it's the government <laughs> you know, charging all the fees, charging the surtax, you know, the taxes on it, the price. Like right now we're selling Pure Sun Farms, you know, despite all the taxes for $100 a an ounce. Like that's like, amazing that we can sell an ounce in a legal store for a hundred dollars who, who would have thought but imagine but the, it would be if if all that tax wasn't on there but they're also like what i think they're like the single single largest lp in the world so they they have economies of scale at play with it allow them to get it to that kind of a price point that you know a small craft grower would not be able to to make that be a reality yeah, they wouldn't be able to support that no Fair enough, but it doesn't have to be like two and a half times, you know, more expensive either. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 I mean, when you're talking about an ounce, you know, there's let's call, let's call it 30 grams in that. So, um, so there's thirty dollars of excise duty right there. So yeah. of that hundred dollars, thirty percent is going to excise yeah. duty. Then there's another. Actually, it'll be, be higher than that because there's going to be the fifteen percent markup that comes after yeah. that, plus whatever margin. So there, so essentially, there's like there's about like a, a fifty to sixty percent tax on of thirty dollars at some point early on on that ounce. Then there's uh -huh. a fifteen percent markup, which will bring it up to I don't know, let's call that fifty dollars of um of of taxes plus sales tax. So so of that of that more than half of that ounce it's is taxes. That's, that's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's why there's a huge, you know, black market. Yeah. There, there's no tax on that stuff, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, it's more than the taxes. Like, if it was just the taxes, I feel like it could be workable but it's the taxes along with years of of trying to get a license the yeah. the hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars that have to be put in depending on the type of facility that you're building the uncertainty yeah. the whole way through that you'll even get your license even though you're putting yeah. you've got time money and energy in and yeah. and then just having a distribution network that like it quite frankly sucks you have yeah. you have government bodies in the middle that are uh acting as gatekeepers who have zero understanding exactly. of of the plant and of the medicine. Yeah, zero value to the to the bag of pot being sold, and they take the lion's share of it. Yeah, they're deterred because again, the the packaging is so disgusting that you know one you. I mean, if you're going to get a jar of cream, you might use it for months, just taking a little bit of cream out. You know, I mean, I'm talking regular commercial stuff, but here you open a, a glass jar and there's uh, three 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 and a half grams in there and uh you can you can roll up seven joints or whatever uh and uh, you can well fat ones but anyways the thing is then you throw that off that whole jar away and it's a lot of time to come in a box and and try and try and uh disassemble the, the plastic lid and the plastic inside the lid and the glass and the label and everything else and then the cardboard so it's unbelievable uh, waste of money too you know that, that adds to the cost right mm -hmm. and it's sad also given how much governments across canada both provincial local and federal there's there's so much talk about 
being environmentally conscious, reducing the carbon footprint, yada, yada, yada. And, and so why create an industry where you're forcing people to just waste copious amounts of plastics and paper yeah. when it's not really necessary? <laughs> like, is, is there's, there's not going to, I mean, I, I understand that they want things to have skews and this, that, and they don't want to do the, you know, the, the deli thing where you, where you would measure, you know, you just weigh out how much, cheese or salami or whatever that you're getting uh, like that yeah. that's that's where i think we need to go with cannabis just get like a big jar from a producer yeah. and yeah, then you weigh out what you yeah. want it's a price per gram and that's that's kind of it yeah. maybe you get a discount when you hit 10 grams <laughs> maybe, maybe for a low volume store that would work but <laughs> i think uh it, it does need to be pre-packed in some way you know for yeah, with the okay so logistically you don't think it's feasible to have this kind of uh, supermarket model well, you could have portions of it. Maybe some some stores could have it, but you know. I mean, with farm sales, sure. Yeah. You know, that's not really a high volume situation. I, I think in what, a high. What did, what did you guys have at Weeds? Was it all prepackaged, or was there some of this? We, yeah, all we did prepack. Yeah. yeah, we had warehouses where we cram people in just to bag weed all day. And so you guys did your packing yourself. Yeah. We did. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And it was all clean, and it was as, as, as little pollution as possible. We were looking for biodegradable bags so that, you know, that they would go back into the environment. Uh, so we were doing it in a very conscious and environmentally friendly way. We barcoded and, all our products as well. Yeah. All our pot, all, every bag, every lot was barcoded. And so, as well. and, and, you know, and, and uh, we, we kept track of all of it. We paid uh, all the GST, PST on it. Of course, back then in the gray market, there was no other taxes on it. Uh, well, we paid inc uh, personal income tax for all yeah. our staff, corporate taxes, property taxes. The only the only tax we couldn't pay was a business license. You know, they call them fees and they call them licenses, but they're all taxes, right? Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, they call they call the the BCLDB calls their tax a markup, but it's a tax. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. they just change the names and then they they, they load up on them, right? Yeah, and I think in 1984, uh, on a 16 dollar bottle of alcohol, the producers got uh, two dollars and eighty cents. The rest was taxes. Yeah, and then and then when I had it in my bar and I sold it, I, I charged uh, uh, you know the, the the, the provincial tax rate at it as well. So there's yeah. a huge, huge amounts of tax dollars in there. That's why they're they're so keen on it. <laughs> yeah, so, and and they're also they're also. I, I realized I was thinking about this like earlier this week, uh, maybe a night or two ago. The VCLDB because we we had them as guests once uh, alongside uh, the LCRB and uh, the Cannabis Secretariat's office. Um, this is around the time they announced all the direct delivery farm gate consumption lounges, and we we had a discussion around those those programs. And in that conversation, one thing that really stuck out to me is when when we when I asked them about the fifteen percent tax, they were very careful about making it clear that it's not a tax. It's not a tax. Charge to mark up. And I was thinking about this earlier this week, and I think I I know why they do that. It's because the Cannabis Act stipulates that you can't have more than a dollar a gram of tax or or 10 percent if it's more whatever whatever is the greater of the two and and that's split between the province and between um the uh the federal government and so yeah. now if they're calling their markup a tax well that that now breaks that whole limit of we're only going to charge a dollar <laughs> so so how do we get around it it's not a tax it's not a tax, <laughs> yeah. just, just, which is kind of devious, really. Like, you know, yeah, one, let, me pay, let me pay my taxes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and the thing is, you know, like, you know, for the, the BCLDB does actually do a service, whether they do it well or not is a whole other question, but they do actually do a service and that they're managing um, a warehouse or handling the logistics, the logistics of distribution and so on and so forth. But it, it definitely seems that fifteen percent is a lot, a much higher uh, markup. I'll, I'll use their terminology than um, than um, what uh, comparable services cost in most other industries. So uh, there's definitely a, a much more significant room there for them to make revenue. And unfortunately, they they have a monopoly. They they control the flow of things and. Um, yeah. I would like to see more transparency from them, but that doesn't seem to be something they're very into. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how all this stuff plays out with uh, direct delivery. Um, yeah, be yeah. Interesting to say the least. We're we're actually very close to uh, submitting for a micro grow. 
Oh, you guys are going to the production game as well, eh? Well, we're we're going to see. I mean, you know, the regulations kind of make it difficult right now, yeah. you know, yeah. obviously, but um, it's something. We do have a greenhouse space, so. Cool. Yeah. Which, which, which part of uh, BC is that in, if you don't mind sharing? In the lower mainland in the Fraser Valley. Cool. Where, yeah, it's a good spot. Awesome. Just, yeah. Awesome. Hopefully, well, that's exciting. Uh, yeah, hopefully they'll let us into that as well. Is um and and so so here's just another example of like some of the the bullshit that's out there. Like for oh, you guys having been incarcerated in the past, you are very much at risk of not being able to receive a security clearance, and yet they won't let you apply for that security clearance unless you spend all the money that it takes to build out your your exactly. greenhouse to the specifications yeah. that Health Canada has. What? So <laughs> what? <laughs> just let me see if I get it or not. You might deny me my license. So why are you making me spend hundreds of thousands of dollars first? Like it, it makes no sense. Um, and for the two of you guys, since since this is clearly going to be something of a concern for you, we had a um, we had a state of craft in the past with Jack Lloyd and uh, uh, John Conroy, and uh, that conversation focused mostly on. Um, the security clearance and a lot of, or not mostly, but a good chunk of it focused on yeah, security yeah. clearance and the challenges there. So if you haven't seen that before, Nick yeah, just we, shared the link there. That would be, oh, that'd be a good one to check out. Yeah. 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 We'll check that out for sure. Cause I know, I know there's a lot of pitfalls to, uh, to doing that, but you know, I mean, this has been our career, you know, for, for Dawn over three decades for me, two decades. So yeah. it's, um, yeah, legalization is you know it been a long time coming, but it's it doesn't mean much when you can't get into you know into a legal job in it. Yeah, and you you guys are clearly very passionate about this. Like just the way you talk about your philosophy and your approach is not your typical. We just want money <laughs> approach that corporate Canada has uh, very much adopted. Thank you for the government. They're just in it for the money. Yeah. Honestly, you know, it, it costs you know an exorbitant amount of money to just get to where we are from legalization to here yeah. to just, you know, try to hang on and uh, yeah. realize our dream. Yeah. We, we wouldn't be here if we, if we hadn't have closed all, all the 36 stores. Yeah. And so it was, it, they forced us to do it and we were, we were employing people. We paid lots of taxes. Everything was going, you know, uh, in favor of legalization the only thing is we couldn't get it was a business license mm -hmm. yeah awesome guys well i appreciate you taking the time to share all that perspective I've, i i know i've learned a lot and really enjoy this conversation and i'm willing to bet that everybody who's been in the audience here has as well and um, on that note let's uh see what our audience wants to know um all right we have david hutchinson here asks have you seen THC levels being overclaimed in legal products? Well, I don't know how I would how I would know that. How how have I seen them be overclaimed? Yeah, I feel like you'd have to like pay for your own lab analysis to see yeah, what the THC goes tested. back, but then then you have to spend all that kind of <laughs> all that money to do that. <laughs> so, so I mean, sometimes on the packages they have a range of you know from eighteen to twenty four or something like that, right? Well, how do they, you know how how are they getting that tested? Where are they, do they have a select sample that they're testing, mm -hmm. and then the rest is the same batch? But you know, like. I think it's just so so overrated, you know. Whatever the levels are, like we we used to um, lab test for cannabinoids and terpene content in all our strains, so we could have that on the strain cards. And THC was, I mean, it, obviously it's an important component, but it wasn't like the major factor in determining what you know what strain people were going to buy. So. Um, I'm sure there are claims. I haven't we seen somebody saying they had over 30% THC at one point? So, you know, yeah. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, you'd have to take, you'd have to have some different to labs are going to give different, different and, and, and it's there models. have been a lot of labs that have been shown to inflate those numbers so that people can get through the gatekeepers it's, that is the government that requires it to be above a certain point yeah, it seems like some of the labs are have different calibrations for sure and yeah. yeah what's uh one thing at one lab could turn out to be another thing but pot does you know the thc does 
change through the life of the, the, the product, right? Like it degrades and turns into CBN. And so there, you are going to lose THC through the life of the product. So Especially if it's a long having period. that number on the label and then having that jar sit there for eight months, the label's probably not that accurate anymore, right? Yeah. David Hutchinson has another question. His second question is, what products uh, you previously, or, or are there any products that you previously supplied, but now, um, oh no, sorry, there's a second comment. I'm going to just read it at verbatim as is. Let's start that again. What products you previously su supplied, but now restricted by Health Canada regulations, would you like to supply? Mm. Well, a lot of the drinks and edibles that we had before. Higher dose edibles, yeah, I, I would definitely. say, would be, you know, higher dose. I mean, 10, 10 milligrams. That's probably really fine for me, but for Don, he's probably going to want 10 times that amount, you know. And, and you don't need to have different strengths of the same thing. You just divide it into four pieces. If if one quarter is good for you at 100 milligrams, then that's what you need, or a, a half of that quarter. And or somebody that has uh, cancer, or they're they're very nauseous all the time, mm -hmm. or all kinds of things like that, they can take a half of that, and then maybe two hours later take another half. Just you know, and so the cost to, of doing that amount of dosage, again, you, you would be in the thousands of dollars over the years as opposed to in the hundreds of dollars. And it's the same thing, you know, you're, you, you, if it's in chocolate, you, you, you're gonna be taking a lot of sugar, a lot of things that you don't really wanna take in, right, so. Back in the day, um, edibles were, were 25, 30% of our sales. Now they're yeah. not even 5% of our sales. They're kind of, almost irrelevant you know and it goes, it goes back to so teaching people about using the oil and whatnot and just, you know instead of trying to find a high dose edible you know and just drop stuff into your food and there's your high dose edible mm -hmm. it's just not a lot of good is, is is that taking off that um approach of is that becoming more more popular the approach of taking a tincture a, an oil extract and creating your own um i know i know we're finding that so in in seashelt it's a little early right now in kingsway you know it's something that we just advise people about you know that the oil is a versatile product uh, for mm -hmm. edibles but um yeah we we haven't had the longevity to see how our edible sales are gonna go in yeah kingsway right yet oh yeah and, and, uh, but i can't imagine i mean 10 milligrams it's ridiculous yeah and speaking of Kingsway, I, we're, we're going to have a grand opening on uh, December the 10th. So uh, Seven days from now. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Well, for those of you in Vancouver or near Vancouver, uh, what's what's the address? Can you can you let us know? 2580 Kingsway. 2580 Kingsway is going to be a grand that's opening on December out. 10th. What time? Uh, well, we open at 9, so I don't know if we're going to – you know it's going to be all day long We're, our store is not huge but we do we do have access to the whole building so we'll have things going on throughout the, the building that day cool um, hula hooping and cotton candy popcorn. And popcorn and stuff get some nice carnival vibes going yeah <laughs> we, we, we've got a, a, an area where, where we can smoke and that sort of thing but anyways, yeah. the consumption lounge yeah that's it's, not attached to the store yeah <laughs> To make and, that clear and um is 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 the are your new stores are they um is the brand weeds continuing or is it a new brand now in the legal it world? is weeds yeah it's, a, okay. it's, a so weeds. it's still, still weeds yeah they let us keep our name which yeah, is weeds, amazing. Uh, and it's a registered trademark yeah it's weeds. a trademark name so we were lucky to be able to to keep that name cool i, I just before we go on to the next questions i've got i've got um curiosity here which is do sure. you have customers who were fans of yours and and really into weeds in the past which i assume you must have had many if you, if you had that kind of commitment to uh ensuring medicinal quality and that you actually weren't impairing your health which you know especially in an unregulated market there's no nothing stopping somebody from using a whole bunch of unregulated pesticides and just mm -hmm. doing, doing a whole bunch of things to ensure that their crop always gets through so and most people won't know um, if that's the case or not. So to have somebody actually be a gatekeeper and ensure medicinal quality is, is such an amazing service. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious if you're finding um, 
in your three weeks so far in Vancouver or in your time in Seychelles, if you're having old uh, customers and fans of Weeds in its previous iteration, are they starting to come to your store now and excited that you guys are open again? They are. Oh, yeah. They are. We are. Absolutely. Yeah. I've been one... waiting for this, and the people are pretty happy. Um, it, even, you know, the, all the, the, the people in the cannabis community in, in Vancouver who are totally against the government, you know, stores and the government weed and all that, you know, they seem to be coming around to us as well and, uh, you know, congratulating us. Whereas I think if we had got into the game like even even one year ago, I think, you know, we would have probably had eggs thrown at our windows and, you know, things like that. Quite well, because people were pissed, right? You know, and in, in the very beginning, anybody from our community going to join the license um, community, you know, were kind of treated as sellouts and whatnot. So it's been a, a big um, education for people in the community to understand, you know, that it's it's not a government thing. It's 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 for Canadians. It's us. It's our, you know, this is our future. This is what, yeah, where we're going. Right. So and maybe it's too challenging and there's a bunch of policies that don't make sense right now, but it's a start and that can be changed. And that's the hope that it will be changed. Otherwise <laughs> it's not going to succeed. <laughs> yeah. I think, I, I think a lot of people are just, you know, really happy that, that we've, you know, achieved a, a dream. It's been a 20 year dream for us that, to have legalization, you know, something that we always heard that would never happen in our time. And, yeah. you know, here we are selling legal weed. It's that's, that's yeah. the amazing part of it. Yeah. For me, for me anyways, you know, Oh yeah. Awesome. Yeah. We were, our, our weed stores were rated 22 times throughout six years. So to not have that, you know, cloud over our head that we can just go forth with confidence instead of, you know, yeah. wondering, and wonder not yeah. fear but you know yeah well yeah just yeah the issues that go with being raided and having to deal with the courts and the police and everything else that goes with it right yeah it's a, it, you have to have a strong backbone to stand up to that yeah yeah and that, 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 that was where my comment earlier came of like you guys are brave and courageous to have gone back into it after being incarcerated that's uh it you're right it, it does need a very strong backbone um marty wig asks who are some of your favorite regulated producers and what is your favorite product wow let's see organic craft it's pretty nice with their platinum grapes yeah that's uh i guess i'm gonna look at fresh stuff because lately uh, you know with kingsway just opening i'm you know getting in so many strains um, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to hype up Pearson Farms too much because, you know, like you say, they don't need it, but, um, you know, they're there for the, we, we're in East Van, right? Like people are working, working folk and they just want a good, good value. I think Pearson Farms seems to be good value. They're not the best pot by any means, but, um, but there is definitely is a place for affordable cannabis. And it's always been clean. I've never had an issue with yeah, any of right. their products, and I have so many SKUs. So, we definitely so, recommend so there's that. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Joint Venture has some good good uh, brands that yeah. they're putting out. Um, quite, a, quite a few of our customers uh, use uh, Joint Ventures as, uh, as their distributor. Yeah. So or Their processor, rather. Yeah. Uh, Montreal Sage and Sour, that was good when that came out. Uh, uh, 1812, the uh, Kush, that's a friend of ours, a previous, uh, well, gray market guy. Actually, we shouldn't say that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's getting better, I think, but. Cool. Thanks for sharing a few names there. Yeah. Um, I actually just heard of Organic Craft for the first time a couple of days ago. And, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. It was a, a thread, and um, there was some article written about that was shared on. Uh, there, there's a, there's a Facebook group for uh, licensed micro producers, uh, um, and um, it's just a place to to talk and chat and help each other out. It's been a it's been a really cool community to see and witness and be part of. And uh, and yeah, that was. Uh, was, I wish uh, I had made a list so I could just 
mean, <laughs> because there are a few like Greybeard is you know that Afghani drifter is pretty nice. Yeah. Well, I feel like if somebody wants uh, recommendations, they could come to your grand opening on December 10th and uh, <laughs> and ask you there for your opinions, and then Absolutely. you'll have more to share. It'll Absolutely. be easy. It'll be easier to be able to look up at the menu and be like, oh yeah, that one, that one. That oh, one, Jen, that one. <laughs> oh Jen comes to mind. Her lemon tea. That's it. Staff favorite. Yeah. <laughs> We have uh, one last question that's got nothing to do with uh, this actual discussion, but uh, Dan Wombolt wants to know, Carol, <laughs> will you be coming home for Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> that's Ottawa. And, uh, no, I'm not going to Ottawa in the end of December. No. <laughs> it's my brother. <laughs> well thank you for answering that question there you have it dad she's not coming home to ottawa for the winter <laughs> to all you, you know they can all come out here for i have eight brothers so they can come here for christmas anytime but why would i go to ottawa why would i go to ottawa in, in the winter <laughs> cool well, thank you guys for your time to our audience thanks for being here if any of you guys missed the first part of this conversation as soon as we hit the stop button here i think a minute or two later it'll replace so you can watch it right away um don and carol thank you guys so much this is an thank awesome conversation i feel very enlightened and uh and learned i'll make up that word there <laughs> about uh the realities that uh, you can do that nowadays you. just make your own words and they yeah work. why not i mean i feel like everybody here understood what i meant when i said and learn it <laughs> <laughs> especially with the context of enlightened right before it <laughs> um, <You're starting> up. <laughs> <laughs> um for those of you watching this on youtube because this will go live on youtube uh please hit the like and subscribe button we'd love to uh, have our content come right to you every single time we put out a new video. Uh, for those of you here right now who want to watch this later, it will go up on YouTube uh, Monday, Tuesday, usually early part of the next week. Um, next up in uh, two weeks, we have uh, an extraction focused um, conversation. We have uh, Bubble Man uh, as a guest. We have Mike West uh, as a guest. And the two of them, Bubble Man and Mike West, they are spearheading a company called Embark, uh, if I remember the name correctly. Um, it's focused on the world of extraction. Uh, and we also have um, uh, Hartley Prosser, one of the founders of uh, Lady Jane cannabis and they are a uh, solventless extraction focused uh, uh, micro producer out of uh, New Brunswick if I remember correctly they also grow their own cannabis they have the breeding program in house to develop genetics specifically for extraction but their focus is on the world of extraction um, and yeah it'll be super interesting uh, to understand a bit of the realities of um, extraction as it relates to uh, craft cannabis because as i'm sure everybody here knows it is a big part of the industry and it's not um an area of conversation we've had uh, uh a guest for so far so i'm personally excited to learn about that because it is pretty opaque to me at this point in time um that should be a good conversation with bubble man thanks yeah it'd be great Two weeks from now, you, you as soon as I hit this end event, everybody who's been registered will get a uh, um, a link uh, to that uh, um, to that uh, next state of craft, and uh, we'd love to see any of you guys here or there if you're interested in it. Um, Thank you guys so much. My name is Sammy. Uh, this has been hosted, the State of Craft, hosted by Certicraft. And if any of you guys watching this are licensed producers or are thinking about becoming licensed producers and are interested in learning about our services, please get in touch. If you go to Certicraft.com, there's a button that requests a demo that you'll see that you can click on to reach out to us. Um, and thank you again, Carol and Don. It's been awesome. And I hope you both have a very, very lovely rest of your day. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, thank you Sammy. Thank you. And thanks, Nick, too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>